Well, if you're just joining us, we are in a series where we're working through the Ten Commandments. Um, And we come to a place this morning where there's a little bit of difference within the Christian tradition. And so I want to tease that out a little bit so that you can make sense of it. If you grew up in a Roman Catholic or a Lutheran tradition, those traditions divide the commandments up differently than the Protestant tradition. So, if you grew up Roman Catholic or Lutheran, you learned that the second commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you learned that the commandment we are talking about today as the second commandment is actually part of the first commandment, which I realize is a little confusing. And what the Roman Catholic and Lutheran traditions do uh, is to divide the, the last commandment about coveting into two commandments. And so they understand the ninth commandment to be, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And the tenth commandment to be, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his servant or his ox or his donkey. Um, the, the, the problem with that way of dividing it is that it's clear in those last two commandments that it's coveting that is the sin that's being prohibited. And that the list of things after that is just an example of the kinds of things we are prone to covet. Uh, The obvious way to divide the Ten Commandments is to see a new commandment every time we read the words, you shall or you shall not. So, for instance, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And then Exodus 20, verse 4 you shall not make for yourself a carved image. These are two separate commandments, and the language of the text shows us that. Um, And by the way, that was the view of John Calvin in the 1500s. It was the view of St. Augustine in the 400s, and it was the view of the great church father Origen in the 200s. And so Calvin said um, this way of dividing the Ten Commandments is historic and time-tested and correct. And I think he's right in terms of how the text reads. Uh, The first commandment then is about worshiping the right God. The second commandment is about worshiping the right God in the right way. Or you might say it this way, God cares about who we worship and God cares about how we worship. Uh, Or you could say it this way, there are two kinds of idolatry. There is worshiping other gods, that's what we talked about last week, uh, taking other things and making them ultimate, elevating them above God. But there is also worshiping the right God in the wrong way. And that's what the second commandment has to do with. So, So let's read the text of particularly the second commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6 together, and then let's explore it, all right? The second commandment says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. All right, so you see the text of the commandment. Now I want to do a little exercise with you to help you understand more deeply what it is that the second commandment has to do with. So so do this little mental exercise with me, all right? I want you, first of all, To think about a unicorn. Okay, so so think about a unicorn. Now I want you to think about the Statue of Liberty. Now I want you to think about the Sahara Desert. Now I want you to think about God. Whatever just came into your mind, when I said think about God, that is what the second commandment has to do with. You see, what we're doing in all those exercises, when I say uh, think about the Statue of Liberty, 
you are forming in your imagination some sort of mental image of the Statue of Liberty. Maybe it's a, a picture that you've seen, or maybe you've been there, or maybe it's just what you sort of imagine the Statue of Liberty to be like, or maybe it's some concept related to the Statue of Liberty, but something is happening in your mind conceiving of that thing. The second commandment has to do with what we conceive God to be like. When someone says the word God, what is the mental conception that comes into our minds? I wonder if you've ever thought of that as so important that it makes the top ten things God is concerned about. Why would that be the case? I want to let C.S. Lewis help us understand why this is such a big deal. One of the famous works that C.S. Lewis wrote, of course, he he wrote many, uh, but one of the ones that's been sort of most uh, beloved throughout history is the screw tape letters. And what it is, is it's sort of an imaginative allegory that imagines um, a master demon uh, discipling a younger and more novice demon in how to tempt a Christian and cause that Christian to turn away from God. And so realize, as I read this, it's like all upside down, right? Like this is what you're not supposed to do. It's a demon telling another demon how to tempt a Christian. And so since we're Christians and not demons, we would just believe the opposite. Something's going to make sense. It's going to be a little confusing if you don't see that, okay? Uh, Otherwise, you'd be like, man, that was a weird quote. I don't know what that's about. All right, so listen carefully to what, uh, remember, this is a work of fiction, It's creative, so so listen to how this master demon explains to this younger demon how to tempt this Christian. The humans do not start from that direct perception of God, which we, unhappily, cannot avoid. If you look into your patient's mind when he is praying and examine the object to which he is attending you will find that it is a composite object containing many quite ridiculous ingredients. I have known cases where what the patient called his God was actually located up and to the left at the corner of his bedroom ceiling, or inside his own head, or in a crucifix on the wall. But whatever the nature of the composite object, you must keep him praying to it to the thing that he has made, not to the person who has made him. For if he ever consciously directs his prayers, not to what I think thou art, but to what thou knowest thyself to be, our situation is desperate. Once all his thoughts and images have been flung aside, and the man trusts himself to the completely real, external, invisible presence, there with him in the room, and never knowable by him as he is known by it, why then it is that the incalculable may occur. Do you see what C.S. Lewis is getting at? What he's saying is, there is the real God completely real, external, invisible, and never knowable by us in the same way that we are known by Him. And then there are the images or the ideas that we have about God. And Uncle Screwtape is saying, if you can get a Christian praying to his idea of God instead of to the real God, that's a win for Satan. This is why the second commandment matters, because idolatry begins in the mind. Let me read to you from another great Christian leader of about the same vintage as C.S. Lewis, A.W. Tozer. Listen to what he says. Let us beware, lest we in our pride accept the er erroneous notion That idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration, and that civilized peoples are therefore free from it. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. It begins in the mind. Wrong ideas about God are not only the fountain from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow, they are themselves idolatrous. The idolater 
simply imagines things about God and acts as if they were true. Before the Christian church goes into eclipse anywhere, there must first be a corrupting of her simple basic theology. She simply gets a wrong answer to the question, what is God like, and goes on from there. Though she may continue to cling to a sound nominal creed, in other words, though her profession of faith may still be orthodox, her practical working creed has become false. The masses of her adherents come to believe that God is different from what He actually is. And that is heresy of the most insidious and deadly kind. So here's the question. What is God like? And how do you know? Where did you get your idea of God? Is it accurate? Is it true? Is it God's idea of God? That is the essence of the question in the second commandment. Do you want to know what breaking the second commandment looks like? It looks sort of like this. I couldn't worship a God who sends people to hell. I couldn't worship a God who predestines some people to salvation. I couldn't worship a God who can't forgive sin without the atonement of the cross. In each of these cases, what people have done is to take part of the biblical material about God to fill it out in accordance with their own imagination of what that must mean and what the implications of it must be, and then to decide based on that idea of God that God is not worthy of worship. But can't you see, that's the very nature of idolatry. That's us making God in our image. Uh, rarely, rarely have I met someone with those kinds of objections who has actually done the work to understand the biblical doctrine of hell in its fullness, the biblical doctrine of predestination in its fullness, or the biblical doctrine of atonement in its fullness. Rather, usually what most of us do is we create a composite picture of God based on our own ideas and what we've heard about God and what other people have said, and we project that onto God and we say, I'm not sure that God is worth worshiping. Well, of course he's not, because he's not the real God. And so, by the way, if you're here and you're a non-Christian, this is why we want to invite you into dialogue and conversation. Because here's my passion. If you're going to reject God, I at least want you to reject the real God. Right? Like, let's at least do the work to figure out who is this God that, that desires your worship. And if you reject him based on reality, then okay. But don't reject a false, incomplete, inaccurate version of God and think that you're rejecting God. Because that would be a tragedy. Okay, so before we go on, I need to nerd out for just a minute. Um, this, what I'm about to say, will probably connect to about 25% of you in here. But for that 25%, what I'm about to say is very significant, okay? The rest of you can just sort of like listen along and go, okay, I'll read about that on the internet later, okay? Um, in what I have said thus far, haven't I just imprisoned us behind Kant's wall? Immanuel Kant, who lived from 1724 to 1804, is one of the most important philosophers in all of Western history. And what Immanuel Kant said was that there are two realities. There is the noumenal and there is the phenomenal. Or there is reality as it is in itself and there is reality as it appears to us. 
and there's a wall between those two things. All we can really know is reality as it appears to us. We cannot know reality as it is in itself, or to say it another way, all we can know is what we conceive God to be like, but we can't ever really know what God is like in himself. In saying what I've said thus far, haven't I just reinforced what Kant already said, and haven't I imprisoned us in a world where we can never know the true God? Yes, unless God has revealed himself. Unless God has revealed himself. Kant is absolutely right unless God, who is ultimate reality, has revealed himself, broken through that wall, and made known to us what he is really like. And friends, that's exactly what has happened. Okay? So, yeah, Kant Kant is right if we factor God out of the equation. If we remove the possibility of revelation... But God has broken through that wall. He has revealed himself. And so though we cannot know him exhaustively in the fullness of his essence, we can know him truly and accurately. Why? Because he has told us what he is like. So to break the second commandment is to impose our ideas about God onto God. To keep the second commandment is to submit to God's revelation of himself. To submit to God's revelation of himself. How do we know what God is like? How do we develop accurate images and conceptions and ideas of God? We listen to how God has revealed himself. We pay attention to what God has said that he is like. And God has revealed himself to us in two primary ways. First of all, God has revealed himself to us in his word. So think about this with me. We live in a relentlessly image-driven culture, don't we? We have televisions in our living rooms, and we have touch screens in our cars, and we have smartphones in our pockets. Everything in our lives is visual. And in the midst of that, God says to us, you are to reject any and all attempts to represent me visually. Instead, you are to know me through my word. Why? I mean, let's be honest, doesn't that make it kind of hard? Don't you sometimes wish instead of giving you a Bible, God had given you like a documentary? Doesn't it seem like that might be easier? Why would God say, You may not represent me through image. I want you to know me through word. Here's why. Because only words are sufficient to reveal what is incorporeal, immaterial, infinite, invisible, and immortal. God cannot be adequately represented by anything that exists in creation because he is beyond it all and above it all. He created all of it. So it is all less than him and none of it adequately represents and reflects him. So how do our minds form concepts of a God who is immaterial? The answer is quite simple, friends, through words. Let me give you an example that I think will help. It's, again, an imagination exercise, okay? I want you to think about the number one. In my weird way of thinking, I'm wondering what font you're imagining the number one in right now. (laughs) Because the font really matters. Like, it can't look like a lowercase l. You probably want to go with a serif font here so that it has the little, you know, thing on the bottom, okay? Okay. But I want you to picture, I want you to think about the number one. Now, where can you take me in the world to show me the number one? Like, you can show me a printed number one on a page. I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, okay, so I see that's a, that's a, a representation of the number one, but, wh- but where do I find the actual number one? You would go, you're weird, man. What are you talking about, right? Um. As you think about and reflect on the number one, here's what you realize. 
You've never seen the number one. You've seen a number one on a page or on a screen, but all that is is a signifier that represents to you this concept called oneness or singularity, right? And so we can say, here's, this is one pulpit, this is one stage, this is one room, and your mind can go, okay, I can generalize from those things to imagine this idea, this concept, this universal called the number one. It's an abstract idea that your mind can understand, even though you cannot show me anywhere in the created world the number one. This is why mathematics reveals God in ways we need. See, God is a similar concept. God is a universal. God is immaterial. God is spiritual. And so he cannot be represented by anything concrete, and yet we can know him. Just like you can know the number one or the concept of peace or the idea of justice. We can know these things because God has wired our minds to think abstractly and to conceive of reality. But for our minds to do that, we need words. And so we keep the second commandment by humbling ourselves under the word of God. And by seeking to know God through his word. This is why the word of God is the centerpiece of Christian worship. This is why every Sunday when we gather, you will notice the word of God begins our worship. We are reading a verse or a text of scripture and saying, here's what God says as he invites us into worship. You'll notice that the songs we sing here in this church are not poppy love songs to Jesus, but rather they are mostly songs whose content come directly from the pages of Scripture that are rooted in His Word. You'll notice that every week we hear the Word read aloud. We have a Scripture reading where we're hearing the Word of God, and then we listen to the Word of God preached. Our worship is grounded in the Word of God. Why? Because this is what God requires of us in the second commandment. And this is what it requires for our minds to form a concept of God that is true and accurate. So so the question for you as you wrestle with your own application of the second commandment is merely this. Do you love, do you treasure, do you revere the word of God? Like are you thankful that God has revealed himself through his word. When we say after the scripture reading, thanks be to God, is that something that you actually mean? Or is that just like, those are the words I mumble after that person gets done talking? They're like, we revere, we are thankful, we are grateful for the word of God. Why? Because, it's, because it is part of how God has revealed himself to us. It is God's self-revelation. It is God breaking through Kant's wall and speaking to us reality about what he is like. By the way, as an aside, this is one of the reasons why you will not find crucifixes or statues of saints in Protestant churches. Because the Protestant reformers understood those things to be violations of the second commandment. Uh, They move us in the direction of image-centered worship rather than word-centered worship. And so what you will see in most Protestant churches is you will find a simple cross at the front and perhaps candles and colors and tapestries that symbolically represent to us various aspects of the gospel message and story. But you will not generally find images, Crucifixes, statues. Why? Because second commandment. Now also, parents, the second commandment is the greatest text in the Bible for limiting screen time with your kids. Right? Christian children need to grow up fascinated by words, not images. They need to be literate. They need to be able to think abstractly. They need to develop a Christian imagination. So, if your kids want to know this week why they can't play on the iPad, just say, second commandment. (laughs) 
So how do we form right ideas about God? How do we keep the second commandment? Well, first of all, by submitting to God's revelation of himself through his word. And second, by submitting to God's revelation of himself through his son. Can you see that the second commandment is not only law, but it is also prophecy? Why would God prohibit his people from making images of him? Because he is preparing to send his own image. God's people in the Old Testament, surrounded in the ancient Near East by cultures who represented their gods with physical, tangible idols, were commanded to have no images whatsoever. They were to be totally alone in their world as the only people on earth who said, we worship a God that cannot be represented by any physical image. Why? To build anticipation. God is preparing his people and he's preparing the world around them for the most dramatic reveal in human history. Like if you thought Fixer Upper was cool, Not a big deal. The second commandment is God setting the stage for the most dramatic reveal in all of history. The incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. God sending to us his very own image. He is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, Hebrews 1, verse 3. And so, the one religion in all the earth that was commanded to have no images ends up having the clearest and most beautiful image of God. How amazing is that? God has revealed himself in his word and God has revealed himself in his son. To keep the second commandment is to submit to God's revelation of himself. To say, rather than projecting upon God our images of what we wish God were like or what we supposed God was like or what we thought God was like, we instead allow God to define himself and tell us what he is like in his word and in his son. And by the way, it is not an accident that the Apostle John says, in the beginning was the Word, and then later on, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why is Jesus the Word? Because Jesus is God's fullest declaration and revelation of Himself. Have you noticed that in Christian art, Almost never, almost never, will you see a visual representation or image of God. Uh, Michelangelo's creation of Adam is perhaps the only exception that I could think of. Um, But even that, we understand, is meant to be somewhat artistic and symbolic. And yet, Christian art is full of images of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some better than others. I think we can all agree we've seen some bad Jesus art, right? Like Jesus is probably not blue-eyed and Northern European. And so it's unfortunate that some art has depicted him as such. But why is Christian art so comfortable painting pictures of Jesus? Because Jesus was a real person. In Jesus, God took on flesh, and so when we represent the Lord Jesus Christ in art, though we should do so reverently and carefully, we are following God's own revelation of himself. This is why in Christian art, you almost never see representations of the Father or of the Holy Spirit, but you see lots of representations of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God's own revelation of himself. He took on human form. We know what a human man looks like. And so we can embrace, okay, this is God's 
imaging of himself. This is God's revelation of what he is like. And so it is appropriate for us then to reflect that in art. God prohibits his people from making images of him because he has purpose to show forth the image of himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the beautiful thing. It's in Jesus and through Jesus that we can obey the second commandment. It's in Jesus and through Jesus that our worship is perfected and made complete. Like, if you've been paying attention so far, here's what probably should be going through your head. Okay, so we're not allowed to have ideas and concepts of God that are ours, that we have made up, but we're supposed to submit to his revelation of himself. So what do I do with all the goofy images and ideas of God that I have? Like, how do I ever get a fully accurate, complete picture of what God is like? How do I make sure that I'm worshiping God accurately in accordance with who he is? That's a serious question, isn't it? Listen to the now deceased, very wise pastor and professor, Dr. Edward Clowney. He says this, May I speak a word of encouragement to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ? If you have been a Christian for any length of time at all, you will have realized that the farther you walk along the road of Christian maturity, the more you realize how desperate your own sin is. How can I ever truly worship God and annihilate the idolatry of my own heart, you will ask. Ed's just doing the cross chart here, you guys. Here's his answer. Let me encourage you to realize that as you are in Christ, you are also worshiping God in Him. As you are in the Spirit, your worship is acceptable in God's sight. We come before the throne not for judgment, but for blessing. In Christ, God can accept your worship as perfectly pure and without idolatry. So do not hesitate to offer your Father in heaven the worship that is in your heart. In Christ, His perfect image, it is purified and made perfect and is a pleasing aroma to God. That's good news. So this morning, God invites us to turn from all of our idols, all of our ways of making God in our own image, all of our ways of bringing Him down to our level, all of our false concepts of Him. He invites us to turn from all of that and find ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to His revelation of Himself in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And to let our worship be perfected through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Jesus, we praise You this morning as the fulfillment of the second commandment the one in whom all the fullness of God dwelt bodily, the one who is the perfect representation of God's nature. Thank you for the anticipation that we see in the second commandment that you prohibited your people from making images because you were preparing to send your own. And so Jesus, forgive us for all the ways that we fashion you in our image that we make you according to our likeness, that we project upon you our concepts of what you must be like, we would humble ourselves this morning and submit to you. We would humble ourselves under your word and under your revelation of yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. To help your word to come alive in our hearts and lives. Help us submit to its descriptions of you. Help us find the fullness of our worship in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that in worshiping him, in bowing before him, 
in humbling ourselves before him, in repenting of our sin and turning to him, we are obeying the second commandment and serving none other than you. Be pleased as we offer our humble worship this morning in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.